you open page one of the book and it is dedicated to the people of Guernsey. Yeah. You know, so it has to be shot here. Is and that... you can't replicate Guernsey. You know, it is unique. Welcome to the Daily Wiki Express podcast. My name is Matthew Leach. I'll be joined each week by a guest for a series of podcasts. Each will shine a light on topics from across the bailiwick. The format will change week to week. We'll have debates, reviews, hot seat interviews and special guests. So stick with us as we offer some insight on some of the most important issues we in the bailiwick face. Toilers of the Sea, Victor Hugo's masterpiece dedicated to the people of Guernsey, is working its way to the big screen. A film production of The Tale of Gilead is getting ever closer to being realised, with pre-production potentially starting at the beginning of 2022. The project is a labour of love for its two producers, David Shanks and Joy Mellins, and during their latest visit to the island I spoke to them about A-list casting, the enduring legacy of the book, and why the film must absolutely be filmed on location in the seas around Guernsey. We're here really because after Covid and everything stopped, um, we were able to, I mean back home we were able to do all the boring stuff, you know, get all the sort of certification that we are eligible for certain tax credits and things like that and work on the budget and schedule and everything else um, but we we're, we're now back to sort of really remind everybody that this is a film that is going to happen and it is going to be shot in Guernsey and so we really needed to go around and meet everybody who's kindly allowed us to use their locations from Moulin Wet uh, Maisie Page uh, and George, they've been brilliant. Um, so we can use their cottage there as Gilead's house. We've been to Castle Cornet um, because that's where we'd like to set up, basically almost like our studio, because Lethley's house will be there, the Market Square. And we want to set up production offices and things like that. So we needed to talk to these people. And similarly, we saw the... Um, Lovely um, Mark at um, St. Yeah, Mark Chamley at it, Mark St. Saviour's Church. But we, what, what happened was we were over here just after Christmas and, and we deliberately thought it was quite a dead time for us so we could self-isolate for two weeks. And then after we came out of self-isolation, we were able to meet everyone. We set up a load of meetings, got things going. We, we ended... Um, the week at uh, the Fleur and we had quite a big do there with yeah. about 70 or 80 people and the momentum and the enthusiasm and everything was really high and we had lots of you know potential sources of finance and so on and so forth and then that night um, you shut down <laughs> yes. oh so sorry and, no, <laughs> it, 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 it was fine I mean these things happen and and, and um, you know, we making films is never never easy, and and so we jumped on a plane, went back to England, and and um, as Joy says, we continued to work, but mainly on the sort of boring stuff, the technical stuff that had to be done, um, and working out how we were going to make the film. The sort of finance raising stopped for a little bit. I mean, we we kept it going as much as we could but you can't do it over zoom and emails and bits and pieces um you'd just be in the island to feel it i suppose yes, yes. we yeah. had to be here so as, as we we've been sitting waiting for the um the 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 drawbridge to come down again and uh, when it came down on the first of july i mean luckily we've both been jabbed and 14 days and all of that and um so we jumped on a plane and this is our first of many visits to Guernsey. We, we've decided that, that in order to really progress this, we, we need a presence here. So every month um, for, the next, for the foreseeable future, one or both of us will be over for 10 days, two weeks, um, just raising our profile and, and pushing, pushing it forward. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, what we've realised is it's our baby and you can't hand that over and hope that somebody else has that same passion. 
we've got a team here that are brilliant and, and are helping us and they're amazing uh, because they have local contacts which I mean through Dave's sister we have um, some because um, Jane lives on the island um, but we we do need the people that are here and that are passionate about the film um, to actually help us with some introductions as well but primarily it's it's us we're we're the ones that will be taking responsibility of making the film yeah. and it's we've done all the groundwork we've got everything in place we've got our key personnel um, so now it's a serious hunt for the rest of the money we have covered some of the budget um, but you always need a certain we have to have a certain amount of equity and it it's a large amount of money so you know they need to be able to trust us and know that it is going to be spent in Guernsey and that Guernsey is going to benefit from it you know and that's the whole point but it's a beautiful film that um, I really believe has to be made I mean personally a couple of years ago I said that's it I've had enough of film I'm not doing it anymore I'm going to teach uh, and so I did start lecturing in film and television at uh, London University um, but then when there was the opportunity for this film I couldn't I couldn't, couldn't not turn be it down. part of it no it's why, just so um, beautiful why Toilers of the Sea then you speak about a passion a passion about it uh, you know where well, does this come from I was brought up in Guernsey and um so it's always been there as a, as a thing, and I've I've always dreamt of making this film. And and many years ago, I, I was um, thinking about it. I mean, I was far too young and far too inexperienced, but with that sort of innocence of youth, I was setting forth on trying to to get it going. And then um, Neil Jordan and I can't, I can't remember his producer. But the team behind the Crying Game. Do you yeah. remember the Crying Game? I heard of it. Yeah. Right. A very successful. Oh, it's a wonderful film. Yeah, film right. set in Northern Ireland. Um, arrived in Guernsey under the banner headline: "The producers of Crying Game come to make Toilers of the Sea." So, I I stepped back. I thought I can't compete with these guys. Um, I wrote to them and offered them my help, but um, and then it. it Life got in the way, mm. things happened, whatever. Never really had the opportunity to, to get it going again until we were over here for my sister's birthday and Potato Pie had just happened and just been released. And, you know, there was a slight groundswell of opinion why wasn't it shot here. Infamously not filmed in Guernsey. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, which was such a shame. I spoke to the producers at the time, or who, who was involved at the time, mm. and they said it was because um, they simply couldn't get over the equipment or keep it in the right place. There it was too right. much logistical issues for them to do it. And it With was the cheaper greatest, to... well, cheaper, yes. With the greatest <laughs> of respect, yeah. the the practicalities are rubbish. Um, <laughs> you, you... Say what you mean. <laughs> It, it could have been done, and, and also, to be honest, I believe quite strongly what they should have done if they decided the logistics were too great and too difficult, whatever, they should have sent over a second unit, because a second unit would have given you the visuals, the thing, it would have established, I mean, film's a cheats game, we, 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 we all know that, that the camera can lie, and, and if, if they'd sent over a, a decent second unit, and got lots of shots of cliffs and rocks and Guernsey and, mm -hmm. and whatever. The farmhouses. And yeah, yeah. The, yeah. The, the audience would have seen the real Guernsey. Yeah. It doesn't matter that the rest of it was shot elsewhere. I mean, with our film, we're going to shoot all of the visuals in Guernsey. But for practical reasons, we have to shoot the rescue... Um, and the rocks and all of the storms and things in under safe conditions. So we need to use a film tank. Okay. We have to. We, we couldn't do it here under controlled conditions safely. So you won't be fighting a real octopus out at sea. Then there will be in a, no, no, be in a tank here. It'll all be the magic yes. of cinema. Yes. E exactly. Yeah. But all of the the rest of the film, all of the bits around it, and all of the. Um, 
CGI plates, you know, the, the electronic wizardry to, to fill in the, the blue screens and the green screens and, and whatever, will be shot here. Mm. So that visually the film will be the bailiwick of Guernsey. Mm. Something to be very really? proud of is obviously sounds like it was always going to have to be Guernsey. Yes, yes. Well, so the, bo- no the book's else. dedicated. The but you know the you open page one of the book and it is dedicated to the people of Guernsey. Yeah. You know, so it has to be shot here. And so, you can't replicate Guernsey. You know, it is unique in its sort of coastline and the rocks and it's it's just and beautiful. The colour of the sea. I yeah. mean the colour of the sea is is unique. It is slightly turquoisey and slightly whatever. Now that doesn't mean anything to the majority of the audience. But to us and to the people of Guernsey who who will be investing in the film either financially or just with enthusiasm and, and support they will see it and we don't want to cheat them. No, absolutely not. I mean, you talk about the film being filmed here and, and making the use of Guernsey and all this kind of stuff. I mean, when are we talking about and how, and how long would the film take to, to film? OK, well, because of Covid and things have stopped, because we initially wanted to shoot this autumn, um, but everything came to a standstill for six months or more and... Um, similarly, we needed a tank, uh, a film tank, and so did a studio. So um, a studio could secure it immediately with their cash. Yes, we, we had a very heavy pencil on the tank in water in November. Yeah. But... But anyway, I mean, that's... To be honest, we stepped back. We said, fine, you know, yeah. um, we can't make that investment because it's too much of a risk to actually book the tank before we're fully funded. You know, it would be insane. Um, but we have booked that now for after Easter next year. So we have the tank for after Easter next year. So the plan is that we um, are going to be here every month up until the end of the year, uh, where we hope to be able to close the finance. And then we will be back in January, where we will set up our production office um, and be here for approximately five weeks of prep where we get everything organised and get the team and the equipment and everything else sorted and then we will start to shoot um, up until before, you know, so we end before Easter and then we'll have the Easter break so that we can then get our crew over to Malta to finish it. So we're looking at roughly approximately ten weeks shoot in all but it will be split between here and Malta because Malta will be all in the tank and it's yeah, about okay. building the ship, it's about building the rocks and it's about getting everything in place there in the tank so everything else will be done here. It sounds like it'll be spectacular. Yes. What, what The end result, what kind of, I know it's hard to ask what kind of film is it going to be because obviously it's based off a book and we all know Toilets of the Sea but you know, what, is, what is your vision for it? Is I think to me it's it's a, an amazing drama that's got lots of jeopardy. He, it's about one man who is prepared to risk everything for the woman he loves. And then because he loves her so much, he, he's prepared to sacrifice as well. And uh, to me, that is a beautiful, simple story that is shown through amazing visuals of the island, of the storm, where you continually build and stack everything against him as he thinks he's achieved one thing, something else comes along. So it's, it's about that building of that jeopardy to the actual climax of where he can achieve it. But a, another part of it, and, and very much an integral part of it, will be the score that goes with it. Because, um, A... For 20 minutes, he's, he's alone on the rock with, with, with nothing around or whatever. But B, music can give you so much in terms of emotion and, and, and storytelling and whatever and augment the pictures that we have. And so we're incredibly lucky that, that we've got John Cameron doing the score. Now, John, apart from being... He was Oscar-nominated for A Touch of Class and various... I think he's done about 50 films... But, um, and, and also he's worked with Donovan and Silla Black and all sorts of other people. But um, he wrote the score for the original 
um, stage production of Les Miserables. Oh wow! Okay. So he he knows what he's he's, 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 he's knows, done this before. Then he knows <laughs> exactly what he's doing, and he also knows Victor Hugo, and he's part part of his passion is 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 for Victor Hugo and, and for the storytelling that he does, and so when we were offered the opportunity to meet him, you know, we jumped at it and, and um, talked to him for a while and, and he absolutely buys into it, in, into the piece and, and um, we're really lucky to have him on board. Yeah, and he actually will be here on Sunday. So you've got, you're talking about people here and crew and stuff like that. Do you have, do you have a director? Yes, we've got director Andy Morahan. Um, again... He's done a, f a few feature films, not not that that many, but we've known him for a long time. And his his, his background, his music, um, you know, he he was or is one of the number one sort of pop music video directors in the world. George Michael wouldn't, when he was alive, wouldn't work with anyone else. He would only work with Andy, and his you know his his list of credits is is enormous, um, but he bought into the project he apps and and to us that's the most important thing that everyone involved buys into it, it, it it's you know we're trying to make a hundred million pound film for 15 million <laughs> um and and to do that you know we want to put all the money on the screen we're not overpaying people we're not doing you know we're doing it efficiently we're doing it carefully um because the the book deserves it. Um, I mean, Vic, Victor Hugo wrote actually very simple morality tales, dressed them up in all sorts of um, verbiage and, and subplots and things and do's. But if you take the core of most of his writing, they're very simple morality tales, mm -hmm. and that's that. That's mm -hmm. what this is, and. And, you know, we feel it, it's a film that will a, appeal to all ages um, and all cultures. Uh, I mean, interestingly enough, Victor Hugo books are now selling um, very well in the Far East, in China especially. Oh, and I, I think that's probably because of that core sort of morality-led Led stories. That, One single that strand that goes yeah. through them. Yeah. yeah. It's strong. Yeah. yeah as, it's as very as strong and yeah. very powerful and, and says a lot to the world. I mean, it still says a lot to the world. It, it's actually quite a relevant film. Yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah. And it's, uh, to me, I, I suppose the last couple of years I feel like I've lived with Gilead. I mean, I, <laughs> I can see him, I can see his struggles and I can visualise, I can see individual scenes in my head you know I, I can see it playing out and I can see that it will appeal internationally because it is going to be it's not an art house film it's an international film um, because because of the story because of that strand because of one man's struggle and what he is prepared to risk for someone else um, and it's and it's also if you think he starts off his journey he, in Guernsey is everybody, nobody wants to know him, you know. He's, he's alienated from everybody else and he has to deal with that and he sees an opportunity not, not to overcome it for himself but to actually realise a love that he has got for Derechette. Uh and so he puts everything at risk for that. And so although the ending people see it as really tearful and very sad, it's... It's actually not. He's actually achieved everything he set out to achieve, and so he's quite, he's quite at ease with actually just going into the sea, just being yes, part he's, of that. He's, you know, he's fulfilled. He's yeah. absolutely fulfilled. He's he 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 he's done it. But, um, it, yeah, and it, it's funny how you know the feedback we get from people in Guernsey. Um, is fantastic. Everyone is very enthusiastic, and we we received a lot of 
sort of um, emails out the blue for just offering help and offering assistance and whatever. And then we got this one email um, that basically said, my daughter's written a song. And we thought, oh, another one, whatever. And um, <laughs> so... The, the thing is, you've got to imagine it. Dave and I take... get takes, quite a few of these. We get loads, yeah. Okay. And, and this particular morning, um, on a Saturday, Dave and I treat ourselves because we work really hard Monday to Friday and often weekends as well. Yeah. Um, but nothing starts until after 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning. That's our rule. Yeah, you know? okay. Um, it's a good rule. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we have breakfast in bed and we put the television on, we catch up with the news and we do our emails and all of this while we're sitting in bed on a Saturday morning. And so because we were sitting there, it was, well, this song's come over. We're just sitting here, let's listen to it. Yeah, you know? okay. Even if it's before 10 o'clock, we can still listen to a song, you know. And so we did and we were both, we both looked at each other and thought, that's amazing, that is incredible. Um, and so we thought, well, is it because we're laying back in bed and we're very comfortable and it, you know, it sounds great? So immediately we forwarded it to John, our composer, and to our director and said, we think this is amazing and has yeah. huge potential for the film because the lyrics are about Gilead. Yeah, okay. Um, and they both came back almost straight away saying, yeah, we love it. You know, we think it's great. It could work really well. And John said he was more than happy to work with the young girl, who at the time was only 14, um, to develop the song and to sort the arrangement and see where it went. And that's why John is over on us. Wow. I'm guessing we're not allowed to know who that person is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, we are. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, it's Elle Lovering. Okay. Um, and I mean, she, she, she's she lives. She, yeah. But she's now old. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, she, she, she's lovely. And her family are lovely. And they live in St. Sampson's. And um, so John's coming over to record her vocals at Apocalypse Studios. Um, so he can record the vocals professionally. He's bringing over a backing track and whatever. Okay. And then we'll be taking it back and using some professional musicians and then going into a proper um, recording studio to mix it and dub it. So we'll have a, a polished version of the song. That'll be utilised in the film? It, it will probably be utilised over the end credits, but we'll also be using it for some promotional purposes and bits okay. and pieces. But because it... It's, it's very contemporary. Yes, yes. You, you'll yes. be hearing it within the next sort have, of few weeks. Yes, oh, we, I'd, I'd really like it. That'd yeah. be great. It's, it's beautiful. It is, and her voice is amazing. Um, it's I, a very, very now voice, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I played it, my daughter's range from sort of 30 to 40, and they've got children, and um, I played it to all of them, and they're very brutally honest, my kids. Um, they've had to be over the years. And uh, they all absolutely loved it. And even my grandson, who's 14, said, well, can I download it? Where can I get it, you know? Um, Soon enough, apparently, yeah. Yeah, and so it's brilliant. And what we've also done is we've hired a local cameraman okay. for the day while she, uh, John and Elle are in the recording studios so that he can film that yeah. as well as... Um, going around the island and getting some atmosphere shots and going out to Moulin Wet so that our director, he's given us a long shot list <laughs> to be honest um, so that we can get all the shots he wants and then he can cut together a music video um, to go with it yeah. So, yeah. so we're very excited about that and it's, it also I think it shows we are totally committed to, this is going to happen you know yeah and the song is just one part of it and there will be other songs on the, on it it won't be the only one with vocals um but that's where andy will hand over to our director because he can pick up the phone for yeah, anybody I, <laughs> I think it also proves our commitment to the island really because We're you know, using local talent in this way yeah absolutely yeah. and and using local technicians and local facilities and and whatever obviously with the whole COVID thing at the moment, one has to be a little bit careful about bringing musicians or using studios or, or whatever. So John's just coming and he's, he's using her vocals and taking them back. But, um, you know, we are 
absolutely committed to to utilizing as much of the talent on the island as possible. Absolutely, and we've all in, every, in front of camera and behind camera. Yeah. I mean, obviously extras and small bit parts and so on and so forth will will be cast from the island. Mm. And we've already, every email that we have received from people here, we've already created a database so that we can contact all of them and say, right, this is what's happening. Because when we come in January, um, we will be in pre-production and that's when we will be getting in touch with everybody as to what we want, when we want them. And and putting the word out, probably, we'll need more than the ones that are already on our database. So, If we um, talk about, I guess... Talk, talking about people then, of course I can't skim around cast. I mean, is that all done now? Have we got, do no. we know who's going to be in it? No, I think, I think the best way to explain cast is we want A-list. Uh, we want at least two A-listers. And ordinarily you see them in the big studio films, which means that they can pay them up front. If we want an A-list now, today, um, we would have to do a pay-or-play deal which means that we pay them what we've agreed, what we've contracted, and if by any chance the film doesn't happen, we don't see that money. It's, it's gone. Okay. We are not, as an independent production, in a position to do a pay-or-play deal. Yet, or at all. Well, we will do it once we're greenlit. Once yes, we, okay, once yeah. The finance once we've got all the money... Then, we'll... then it's fine. Yeah. It's not a risk. You know, We're not losing or giving that money away. Once we know that the money is there to make the film, then we will do the deal, the pay-or-play deal, and it will be sent over with the contract, yeah. which is fine because that gives us the comfort that they're on board. Um, so but... conversations have happened with people that, you've, that you are interested in? With Com- their agents. With their agents. Okay. There are various, I mean, there are, there are a small number of agents who deal with the majority of, of the cast that we want. And um, they've all had the script. Um, and in a sense, it has to get past the agent before it goes to um, uh, their, clients. Uh, their clients. So so they all have to approve the script. Well, so we've deliberately sent, sent the thing out and saying that when we're in a position we will be looking at for this, would you read that? And they've all read it and they've all come back and said, fine, tell us when you got the money. So they're interested? Yes. I mean, who wouldn't yeah. be, I suppose? Yeah. This is... It's, well, it's, it's a, a classic. It, yeah. It, it, you know, it's, it's potential it's, for Oscar nomination, yeah? I mean... Yeah, this, I mean, especially for, for, for Gilead, this is his movie. This is... Um, it's not been done before. No. Toilers of the Sea. The very in, there have been f- about nineteen thirties. Okay. Like yeah. That. No. This 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 is new, uh, this is the only the, there was a, a sort of adaptation that was done in the fifties with um, I can't remember his name but um, it was called called something else that was based lo- very very loosely based on this is the uh, the first real um, Modern adaptation of the I book. Suppose, yeah. And and um, if you think of DiCaprio in The Revenant, yeah, you know that film was DiCaprio, the, the, the great film and other things and whatever. But it was very much his. This is very much Gilead's film, yeah. and um, the actor who is privileged en- enough to do it um, has the opportunity to really showcase their talents, and and um, you know we. We will support him in doing that, and it will make a wonderful film. Did you have somebody in mind when you started it? I guess this isn't the kind of you can't we can't name anybody at this stage. No, we, we, we had we, we're looking we're looking for for someone with the power to do it. I mean, it, Gilead is is a very specific character in that he's he's not a pretty boy. He's not a um, whatever, but he he goes through the whole range of most. So we've we've got a short list of about six mm. that that we think are big enough and capable enough to do it. And the same for Leathery Roll. We've got the list of about six, and we've got three or four for Derechette. 
So. That's how I do. And their agents have got the script, and we've got casting directors sort of that have got those relationships with the agent because that counts for a lot as well. But anyway, things that have come up. Over I would the love year. to re- revisit this after this has all yeah. come and gone, and we've we've all seen it. It'd be amazing. Yeah. But I will have to uh, tie that up there. So I just want to say thank you very much for coming in and, and talking to us. Well, Not you. at all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for listening to the Bailiwick Express podcast. The title track was Shift My Weight by Luno. If you enjoyed it, I know it's a pain, but please like and share. It all helps. And remember, you can hit bailiwickexpress.com to stay right up to date with whatever is happening in the Bailiwick. You can find us online, on social, on email, and on internet radio. There'll be more from me, Matthew Leach, and all the Bailiwick Express team next Friday.